So let me give you an example. I'm going to word this to you and then I'll write down the symbols. Can you prove that the average of two square numbers, and I'm, the, the sim, by the way, turning this into symbols is part of the question, which is why I'm deliberately not writing that for you. The average of two square numbers is always going to be bigger than, make sure I get my inequality direction right, it's always going to be bigger than the square of the average of the two numbers you started with. Does that make sense? Let me say it one more time, right? You have two numbers, two numbers. If you squared them both and then averaged whatever you got, right? You started with two numbers, you squared them, and then you took the average of whatever the sum was, okay? That's always going to be bigger than if you took those two numbers that you started with, find the average first, and then square, okay? Can you turn that into symbols? Can you think about whether one or several of these strategies might help you to actually prove that? I'll give you about a minute to see if you can at least state it, and then I'll put it up on the board. I'm still not going to show you the answer, but at least you'll know you're on the right track. Have a shot. Turn that into some symbols. So, I'm sensing that feeling in your brain when you're like, uh, where am I going? Or I think I have something, but is it right? Let me help you out first by telling you how not to do this question because it's so important, as you've seen in this topic, counterexample can be very powerful. So, eyes up. Uh, I promise everything I'm about to write, I will leave on the board so you'll have the time to jot it down afterwards. But I really want your focus for this part because it's a crucial bit right at the beginning that several of you, because I've had a look at your books, um, I know you've missed. So, still waiting for full attention. We're almost there. Thank you. All right. Let's have a go. Now, I promised I would show you how not to do this before I show you how to do it. Here's how not to do this. This is my algebra. I've worked so hard to turn this verbal mess into a symbolic nice thing. Now, I'm going to start doing things with this. I'm going to be like, ooh, ooh, I know. I want to try and do what I can see here, right? See that? Getting everything on one side. This is what I want to work with. And then I start to say, well, on the right hand side, I've got that being greater than zero because I subtracted it. And then off I go and continue, right? What's the problem with this line of argument? Why is this an issue in our topic, nature of proof? Before I even go any further, I've already made a huge blunder. Anyone want to tell me? Chai? It's solving. It's solving. What do you mean by, or what does anyone think that means? Like, I'm, I am kind of trying to solve, get down to the bottom here. Why is that a problem? I love solving things. What's the big deal? Again? You've taken the statement as true, which is what you're already trying to prove. Right in lesson one, in this topic, right? We said statements are the things you're going to be working with, right? Mathematical statements are either true or they are false. Sometimes you don't know which it is, sometimes it's conditional. But the point of a proof question is I want to establish the fact that this is true. That's my job, right? But everything I've go I'm going to continue from here is actually standing on the foundation of this already being true. Otherwise, you can't do anything with it. Does that make sense? So if you have a look, and this is why I keep using uh, these same letters over and over again. This stands for required to prove. I can write this thing down. I want it in my head, but I don't want to write it down as if I know it to be the case, because then you've already started at your logical conclusion. And wherever you go at the end, you'll be like, oh, what, what have I just established? Answer nothing because that's where you started, okay? So here's how I'm going to do this instead. Uh, I can't say this because I'm not using this required to prove line as a foundation. There's lots of ways to do this first bit, but I think a way that's fairly nice and neat is just to say, well, this thing, having subtracted this from both sides, this is the thing that I want. You can see if I prove this, then it implies this, which is what I'm after. So all I have to do is say, well, how do I introduce this thing? I'm going to consider this particular mathematical object. Where did I get it from? And the answer is, this is the thing that was on the left of the inequality. And then this is the thing that was on the right of the inequality. That's the object I'm now thinking about. And now I can let loose on my, all the algebraic manipulation that I want. And I can try and prove that this thing is greater than 0, which will prove that the original inequality is what I'm after. Does that make sense? Now from here, actually, several of you have some pretty good working. You can see, for instance, 
this equals, like you're going to get, uh, this is going to be a 2, but that's going to become a 4 when you square it out. So I'm going to anticipate I want to collect like terms. I'll write this with a denominator of 4. And then I'll get busy expanding this thing. So what do you get on the numerator? A squared plus this is the easy bit. Yeah, this is a squared. Plus sure, you can do it whichever order you like. That's OK. Additions commutative after all. OK, so I've got this, right? Uh, and you can see you've got a whole bunch of like terms because I've already got my common denominators. So how many a squareds will I have left on the top? One a squared and one b squared. Single a squared, a single b squared. And then what else do I get on the numerator? Minus 2ab. Yeah, what's your negative, right? So minus 2ab, but hopefully at this point you're like, aha, this is another object having simplified that I can work on. I, should forget, I shouldn't forget that there's division by 4. What can you do with this numerator that uses one of these techniques over here? What can you do with it? You can start with an f. What's this thing called? I can factorize this, right? So this is actually a perfect square, namely this perfect square, right? That's going to be greater than 4. But I can now say, Hold on a second, remembering that right at the beginning of this I said this big umbrella over this is that we're in real number land. So this thing here, right, A minus B, if A is real and B is real, then what can you tell me about A minus B? Also, also. also real, right? So I've got a real number being squared. The smallest that can possibly be is zero. Make sense? So I can say, and this is, this is that weird bit, going to this whole, like, we can change what's happening to both sides, right? I can say that this is greater than or equal to zero. That's a claim. I also need a substantiation. What's my substantiation? A minus B, that's a real number. Because A and B are real numbers. Does that make sense? Now, it's true. Uh, there's one thing that I left out. It's somewhat usually assumed, but a good, nice, nice, neat question, unlike me, a human being, will always state this explicitly at the beginning. When we say A and B, we're also not just going to include that A and B are real, but we tend to mean, when we use different pronoun rules, we also tend to mean that A and B, you should write this down because it's a phrase you're going to see a fair bit, A and B are distinct. Uh, you might remember this word back from when we were doing uh, discriminant, quadratic. Sometimes you got uh, roots that were together, but sometimes they were apart, which is what we mean by this word. So I so far got that this left-hand side minus right-hand side is greater than or equal to zero. I actually don't want that equal to case. If I return back to my original question, it's just an inequality without the boundary. So how do I get rid of, using this fact that I've just reminded you of, how do I get rid of that boundary? What do you think, Brian? Yeah, very good. A and B are distinct. I can say that just like I did in this line. I can state that algebraically. I can say, but A is not equal to B. Yeah? Since A and B are distinct. And what that implies is A minus B, it can't be zero, like I've just subtracted B from both sides. Are you okay with that flow of logic there? This implies this. So therefore, that's gotten rid of my boundary case. So now I can tie this up in a nice neat bow. What have I got? I promised that everything would stay on the board. I think that's just barely still true if I say that. I began with my left-hand side and right-hand side. Let's write that down. a squared plus b squared on 2 average of the squares. And I'm subtracting a plus b on to the square of the averages. What have I just established? That that's greater than zero. I got that it was greater than or equal to zero, and then I went a step further to prove that it's greater than zero, full stop. Okay? And now I'm right here at this line. See how I've gotten there? Right? So now I can get back to the thing that I wanted. a squared plus b squared sum, or rather average of the squares, is greater than the square of the average. How do you feel about that? Is that okay? Do you see how we had to use these pieces here?